Behold, reader, the invention and whole substance of this little book. In memory of the event, I am writing down for you the sentence in the words from that moment of conception. The Earth's orbit is the measure of all things. Circumscribe around it a dodecahedron, and the circle containing this will be Mars. Circumscribe around Mars a tetrahedron, and the circle containing this will be Jupiter. Circumscribe around Jupiter a cube, and the circle containing this will be Saturn. Now, inscribe within the Earth an icosahedron, and the circle contained in it will be Venus. Inscribed within Venus an octahedron, and the circle contained in it will be Mercury. You now have the reason for the number of planets. With these words, Johannes Kepler began his slender book with the improbably long title, The Introduction to the Cosmographical Essays, containing the cosmographical mystery of the marvelous proportion of the celestial spheres and the true and particular causes of the number, size, and periodic motions of the heavens, demonstrated by means of the five regular geometric bodies. More commonly known by its abbreviated Latin title, Mysterium Cosmographicum, the work was a realization of Kepler's desire for a harmonious creation as found in the geometry of the platonic solids. It brought his name into the circles of learned men who found his ideas intriguing, even as they were on the periphery, and made him known to some of the most well-known astronomers of his time. It was, perhaps, the first true work of astrophysics, written by a man who was paid to cast horoscopes. It was also very, very wrong. Yet, somehow, even in its unrealized error, it pushed Johannes Kepler in all the right directions. For the first time, a Western thinker attempted to bridge the gap between the what's and how's of celestial motion and the why's. For the first time, someone was no longer content to merely build models, instead seeking for the forces that drove them. As Owen Gingrich has said, quote, Seldom in history has so wrong a book been so seminal in directing the future course of science. End quote. Kepler's cosmographic mysteries would launch a 20 year quest to discover the underlying harmonies of the world that would lead him to put forward three laws of nature that would describe the motions of the heavens with an accuracy never before attained. More than that, Kepler would be among the first to attempt to unify the forces that cause motion on the earth with those that cause them in the heavens, thus obliterating a distinction that had been in place for almost 2,000 years. Hello, and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 3, Finding Our Place. Episode 16, The Harmony of the Worlds. Johannes Kepler's name had first come to the attention of Tycho when the latter had received a copy of the Mysterium Cosmographicum in March of 1598. It came at the same time of another book, Ursus's Fundamenticum Astronomicum, wherein Brahe's rival claimed to have been the originator of the Tychonic system. Fortunately for Kepler, Tycho set aside his anger about Ursus's plagiarism long enough to give Kepler's work a fair read, and in it 
he saw the marks of true talent. He also saw both the problem to be solved and an opportunity to be grasped. To understand this, let's take a moment to understand how all this got started. Our narrative this week really begins in Graz in 1595 with the astonished realization of a Lutheran trained mathematician that the heavens were indeed a place of platonic harmony. As is our now familiar custom, we'll save the details of Kepler's life to supplemental episodes and so we'll just note a few of the relevant pieces here. Kepler had been a pious central German boy of some remarkable talent who had planned to train for the ministry. He had received bachelors of arts from the seminary at Malbron and had gone to Turbigen to study at the theological school there known as the Stift. During his time, he had studied through the typical Philippist curriculum, which included, of course, mathematics and astronomy. For reasons we'll delve into in a later episode, Kepler was deeply committed to the idea of there being a platonic harmony to the universe that reflected the mind of God. This commitment carried over into his study of both music and astronomy, as each related to mathematics, something he truly excelled at. As part of this, he became a student of Michael Maestlin, who shared with him his belief in the correctness of the Copernican system. Kepler was soon converted. In his third year at the Stift, 1594, he was completing his work for a master in theology and waiting to be called to a pulpit when the university received a call from the Holy Roman Empire for someone to teach history and mathematics at a preparatory school in the city of Graz in the Austrian province of Styria. Much to his surprise and disappointment, Kepler was chosen to fulfill this role, a decision he accepted on the condition that he might return to the Stift at some later date to complete his theological studies and enter the ministry. This never actually happened. This is how the Lutheran Kepler, who had occasionally Calvinistic tendencies, ended up in a Roman Catholic province of the Holy Roman Empire at the equivalent of a Protestant high school. It was not something he was particularly good at. As part of his appointment, he was also the district's mathematician, meaning that he consulted on a number of things, most importantly on the casting of yearly horoscopes to predict the events for the coming year. This, on the other hand, was something he was pretty good at, though this may have had a lot more to do with his keen eye for detecting and understanding the Byzantine geopolitical currents of South Central Europe. And it was while giving a lecture on astronomy to a rather bored classroom of students that Kepler had his great insight, one so profound that he recorded the date of the lecture, July 19, 1595, for all posterity. What he had been discussing with that classroom full of bored young men was what is known as the procession of the conjunctions. As we've mentioned in previous episode, conjunctions are when two astronomical objects are near each other in the sky. In this case, it was Jupiter and Saturn. Since Jupiter travels more rapidly around the ecliptic, that band of constellations through which all planets, including the sun and the moon, travel, than Saturn does, it will catch and pass Saturn every 20 or so years. Now, in the time it takes for Jupiter to catch up to Saturn after passing it, Saturn travels a little more than a third of the way around the ecliptic. After three conjunctions, then, Saturn will be just a little past that location of the first conjunction. What Kepler did in class was draw a line connecting the first conjunction to the second, and then another connecting the second to the third, and then the third to the fourth, and so on. What he saw as he built his diagram on the blackboard with chalk in front of those bored students was a triangle that slowly turned or processed. In doing so, the sides of the rotating triangle transcribed out an inner circle while the corners of the, that triangle defined an outer circle. In this, the inner triangle was exactly half the size of the outer triangle. What was more important was that he realized that Jupiter's orbit in the Copernican system was almost half the size of Saturn's, just as the circles on his board were. It was as if a bolt of lightning had struck him. However, it behooves us to take a moment to take a step back here and make an observation. When Kepler had gotten the job in Graz, he had realized that he would be doing a lot of work in astronomy, and so, consistent with his character, 
Kepler had thrown himself into learning every single thing he could about the subject. More than this, though, Kepler's Philippus training and his personal background had conditioned him to look for both harmony and divine cause in the universe. As such, when he chanced upon the circles in this diagram, his discovery of the congruence between the ratio of the orbit sizes of Jupiter and Saturn and the ratio of the sizes of the two circles, while serendipitous, was not accidental. He had spent much of his life learning to look for just such things and had within him the desire not only to see what those things did, but also to understand why they did them. This drive to understand the whys of things had led Kepler to ask a variety of questions in astronomy. Things like, why were there only six planets in the Copernican system? Why not seven, or ten, or a hundred? Why did the orbits of those planets have the spacings they did? Why did the planets move at the rates that they did? This was a big step in astronomy, and one not without controversy. In the traditional scholastic model, based on the work of Aristotle, physics was the thing that explained the causes of motion, while astronomy just tried to model it for the objects in the heavens. In this division was the explicit idea that astronomy was not to speculate on the causes of motion, since its models had been required to set aside a number of Aristotle's principles on the causes of motion to accurately model what was taking place in the heavens. Kepler, though, was not satisfied with that distinction. He thought that astronomy had to work in conjunction with a set of underlying causes that were harmonious. In other words, there had to be a reason for all the things astronomers had seen and measured over the millennia. This belief would drive his work for the rest of his life, and it would be the thing that would propel him towards his discoveries, both imagined and real. In this case, he began to wonder if the spacing of the orbits of the planets in the Copernican system could be explained through the use of polygonal figures. And as a side note here, from now on, when I mention Kepler trying to show or prove this or that, let's understand that it's always going to be with regards to the Copernican system. After his conversion to heliocentrism by Maestlin, Kepler will never waver from his belief in the fact that that was the correct description of the solar system. Okay, so back to what we were talking about. Now, what do I mean when I say polygonal figures? Well, in mathematics, a polygon is a two-dimensional shape where all the sides are the same length and all the angles at which they join are also the same. An equilateral triangle is the three-sided polygon, a square the four-sided one, a pentagon the five-sided one, and so on. The interesting thing is that there are an infinite number of these, as the number of sides can be arbitrarily large, and the shape of a polygon, as the number of sides becomes infinite, becomes a circle. You can see why Kepler might have found this attractive. Unfortunately, while a triangle seemed to work somewhat well for explaining the relative sizes of the orbits of Jupiter and Saturn, the idea sort of broke down after that. While Kepler could make things work in some of the other planetary orbit ratios, it all seemed a bit ad hoc when he did. Then he hit on a slightly different idea. He realized that space is actually three-dimensional, and if there were spheres that were holding up or governing the motion of the planets, they would need to be considered in three-dimensional spaces. What that meant was that polygons weren't the right kind of figures. What Kepler needed to look at was their corresponding three-dimensional figures, i.e. three-dimensional figures made of polygons. When Kepler re-examined the orbital size ratio for Jupiter and Saturn, but this time used the three-dimensional analog of the square, something we of course call the cube, he got an even better agreement with his ratio. Now this is where things get really interesting. Unlike in the two-dimensional case, there aren't an infinite number of these three-dimensional figures that have sides that are all polygons of the same type. It turns out that there are only five of them. The tetrahedron, the cube, the octahedron, the icosahedron, and the dodecahedron, corresponding to four, six, eight, twelve, and twenty sides, respectively. If you've ever seen gaming dice, you know what I'm talking about. 
those things that you see guys using to play D&D or something like that, those dice with all the different kinds of sides, those are what we call the Platonic or Pythagorean solids. Kepler realized if there were only five of these and they were responsible for holding up the spheres of the planets, then that would explain why there were only six planets. Can you imagine what Kepler must have felt like as all of this started to come together? It must have been both exhilarating and awe-inspiring and also profoundly humbling for him to believe that he was looking into the structure of the universe designed by a mathematically consistent God that he could understand. As he calculated the various sizes and ratios, he was pretty close on four of the five and not that far off on the other. For him, it was confirmation of the correctness of the Copernican system because it explained both the number of planets and the spacing of their orbits. As he was working this out, he was also trying to think about or understand the speeds of the planets in their orbits. He understood that if all the planets moved at the same speed, Saturn, of course, would take longer to go around the sun than Jupiter because it would have farther to travel since it was farther away. However, Kepler realized that even if this were taken into account, Saturn was still moving slower than Jupiter, Jupiter slower than Mars, and so on. He began to try to think of why that might be. It would be an idea that would evolve over time, but Kepler began to think that maybe Aristotle's idea that the physics of the Earth and the physics of the celestial realm weren't different at all. Copernicus's model suggested that the distinction might be done away with, and so Kepler took the step of thinking that the causes of motion on Earth were in fact the same as the causes of the motions in the heavens. And so we need to take a moment or two to remind ourselves where that stood at this point. If you'll recall from way back in the series, right before the great mortality had descended upon Europe, some of the natural philosophers, most notably Buridan and Oresme, had called into question Aristotle's description of the causes of celestial motion. Most importantly, they had introduced the ideas of accelerated motion and impetus. From this, they had codified a model that suggested that for an object to move faster, it had to be pushed harder. This had sort of been a part of Aristotle's description, but the scholastic natural philosophers both refined the idea and expressed it algebraically. What Kepler did was begin to think about celestial motion in the same way. He thought if Saturn were moving slower than Jupiter, it was because it wasn't being pushed in its path around the sun as hard as Jupiter was. This brought up a question as to what was doing the pushing. Well, Kepler reasoned, if the force on the planet seemed to be getting weaker the further something was away from the sun, maybe the sun would be the source of the force. It was a very compelling idea, assuming, of course, you thought the human beings should be sniffing around for the causes of celestial motion, which everyone really knew were due to the actions of angels, at least if you were good scholastic. Now, before we get carried away and begin thinking that Kepler has just figured out gravity or something, let's understand that his force was not something that pulled things together. He wasn't trying to describe why things fell. We'll leave that till later in the work of some little-known Italian natural philosopher. Kepler's idea was that the sun created some sort of swirling kind of thing, like water swirling around a drain or a whirlpool. This swirling stuff, maybe ether, he didn't know, created a motive force on the planets, but that force was weaker further away from the sun. He didn't have much of an idea of what it actually was, but I think it's a really intriguing idea. It really shows a truly creative mind at work. It also happens to be wrong, as are all of these ideas. But as you know, if you've been with us here on the Odyssey for a while, being wrong isn't all of that big a deal when it comes to doing science. What this all shows is that he's thinking in new and creative ways to solve problems and extend ideas. In short, it's brilliant, and when it was published, it caught a lot of people's attention.
After consulting with a cautious but optimistic Maitland in 1595, Kepler published the Cosmographic Mysterium with its polyhedral model and his discussion of the various causes of motion. As I've alluded to, while the model was well received, the discussion of the possible physics behind it all was not so positively embraced. A number of scholars, Maislin among them, chastised Kepler for seeking to understand what drove the motions of the heavens for a whole variety of reasons. Everything from contradicting Aristotle's description of motion to, pr to presuming to look into the inscrutable reasoning of the divine. For Tycho, however, neither of these things really much mattered. What he saw were three things. First, like everyone else, he saw a brilliant mind, one that could unravel data to fit mathematical models. More on that in a bit. Second, he saw a Copernican who posed a threat. Third, he saw someone who could be used in his escalating flame war with Ursus. Let's take these in reverse order. Kepler, in his desire to gain some recognition and support, had gotten himself involved in the ongoing priority dispute between Ursus and Tycho over who would come up with the Tychonic system. Kepler, of course, had no idea about what was going on, and so, in an instance of flattery, had written a fawning letter to Ursus praising his work. Ursus had used this letter as one of the pieces of introductory material for his book, which had been published after Kepler's book had come out and made a bit of a splash. When Tycho received the two books together, Ursus's and Kepler's, he was able to sort out and sort of put two and two together, and he realized that he had an opportunity to get Kepler to renounce his support of his rival and thus embarrass him if he could bring Kepler into his sphere of influence. The problem with this, of course, is that Kepler and Tycho didn't see eye to eye as to which model of the solar system was the right one. This, however, was a bit of a lesser point, as both men understood that the question would only be settled with data. Data that only Tycho possessed, and at least to this point, declined to publish. Finally, as Tycho moved closer and closer to the court in Prague, he found himself more and more often in want of good assistance. While he had been in Denmark and then in northern Germany, he had had a regular supply of young university students eager to work with him. However, once he left Havan and traveled further and further south, that stream sort of dried up. He didn't have the same networks established in the central and southern European universities, and so when he did get students, they were often rather inferior. In Kepler, Tycho saw a man of true talent. While the time was not quite right in 1598, Kepler would never be far out of the mind of Brahe. For Kepler's part, 1597 was a good year in many respects. His book was well received, his position there was secure, and he married a fairly prosperous widow by the name of Barbara Mueller after a bit of a rocky courtship. This, however, began to change for the worse in 1598, as the forces of the Counter-Reformation began making life rather miserable for those in and around Graz who were not of the Catholic faith. While Kepler's position as district mathematician kept him from suffering from the worst of the abuses heaped upon the Protestants in the region, he soon understood that his position there was untenable. Just as Tycho had found himself a bit of a refugee from his own land in 1597, Kepler was unwelcome in his home just a year later. And so would be set the circumstances of the two's eventual meeting. It all took a lot of doing, something that we'll cover in the supplemental episodes. But eventually Kepler was brought on by Tycho as an assistant in around 1600. By this time, Kepler was working on a modification of his polyhedral theory that sought to quantify the relationship between a planet's distance from the sun and the time the planet took to travel around the sun one time. This idea was based on the harmonies found in the ratios of string lengths in musical instruments, and so it was sometimes known as Kepler's harmonic theory. While the new theory seemed to offer a way forward, Kepler needed Tycho's data to see if his modified model would work. As such, he really resented the fact that Tycho wasn't publishing that data. For fans of Tolkien's The Hobbit, an apt analogy, at least from Kepler's point of view, was that Tycho was a lot like the dragon Smaug, who sat, day after day, hoarding a treasure of data, a veritable mountain of knowledge, 
unwilling to share his wealth, but unable to use it himself. From Tycho's perspective, he had brought on a potential rival who had once written a pretty complimentary letter on behalf of his sworn enemy. Why should he trust this unknown newcomer with the work of a lifetime when he might just take it and use it to either prove his own competing theories or, worse, turn it over to Ursus? Especially when Tycho still had two pretty darn good assistants who seemed to be making progress. Longo Montanus and the son of a nobleman named Teng Nagal. However, before long, both men exited the day-to-day -day work with Tycho. The first to go was Longo Montanus, who would initially be switched to trying to work out lunar theory in the Tychonic model, thus leaving Kepler to work on the problem of the motion of Mars on his own, and then who would eventually succumb to homesickness and return to his native northern Germany. The second departure was Tennegal, who married Tycho's second oldest daughter, something that more or less promoted him out of working as an assistant. This left the two men at a crossroads, and after some seriously difficult negotiations made possible only by Tycho's surprising amount of patience with the impolitic Kepler, things were worked out so Kepler would have full access to all of the data. It was not long after this that Tycho attended that ill-fated banquet that would lead to his death in late 1601. Thus was Kepler left in possession of both the treasure trove of measurements, but also Tycho's recently granted position of imperial mathematician to the increasing erratic Rudolf II, Holy Roman Emperor. Now all of this was really a godsend in some ways for Kepler, who could now work unfettered from any obligations that Tycho might have placed on him. He would no longer be forced to waste time trying to prove a model he felt was wrong and a step backwards, though, as we've mentioned, this is an unfair characterization of Tycho's work. One thing that I should mention here is that Kepler's model may have suffered from a flaw. From what I've been able to read, Kepler's model keeps the idea of at least physical spheres, if not an entire solid physical structure based on these polyhedral figures. It seems to me that Tycho's work on the Comet of 1577 had more or less done away with these sorts of things, though. What I haven't been able to track down is how Kepler would have reconciled these two things. I imagine he had to know about Tycho's work, at least through Maston. I don't know if he had an answer, or if he just sort of ignored Tycho's data, but one has to wonder if he just sort of swept the whole thing under the rug at first in pursuit of his own model. If there are any good historians of science out there who might have insight that they can uh, give me on this, please feel free to drop me a line. I'd love to know. From 1601 to 1605, Kepler worked to try and fit Tycho's data to various descriptions of the motions of things in the heavens, and this is where the accuracy of Tycho's data becomes so very important. At one point, Kepler had managed to construct a model built on circular motion that could match all of the data Tycho had collected to Mars to within about a 10 minute accuracy or so. However, that was 10 times bigger than what Tycho had claimed to be able to do, and about two and a half times bigger than what Kepler had thought Tycho had been able to accomplish. It is at this point that Kepler does something really, really remarkable for his time, something that we take for granted in science now. For one of the first times in modern history, Kepler decides that the data is precise enough that it has to be right, and his ideas based on some philosophical preference of how the universe ought to be were wrong. I don't think it can be overstated as to how huge a deal this was. For some 400 years, the scholastic tradition had supported ideas over data, usually to be fair, because the, when the data was actually collected, it was just so bad. Now, for what was likely the first time, the data was good enough to put one's faith in it, and that's what Kepler does. As hard as it was to do, he rejected his painstakingly created model and began to look for alternatives. 
Personally, I think it's a watershed moment in the history of science. So where does Kepler go from that point? Well, the big breakthrough, after a lot of fruitless effort, seems to have been that he had to admit that if the Earth were a planet, like all of the others, it would have to obey all of the same motions, including changing its speed around the Sun as it moved. Now, Kepler had already done a lot of work thinking about the orbits of the other planets. He realized that if the Sun were off-center of a particular planet's orbit, that planet would get closer to the Sun and thus, if his force hypothesis was correct, experience more force and therefore move faster. This was all well and good, except that it had failed to explain the full effect of the change in motions. If Kepler then added an epicycle to that circular orbit, he got too much of an effect, and some of it in the wrong places. Finally, after a lot of calculating and a few algebraic mistakes, he hit on the correct idea. As Apollonius had shown, and Hipparchus and Ptolemy had used, if you put a circular epicycle on a circular deferent, the path of a point on the epicycle through space, if the parameters are set correctly, is an oval of sorts. This is what everyone up to this point had done with the orbit of the moon around the Earth. The problem was, is it didn't actually work as well as one would hope, occasionally predicting the wrong day for an eclipse or something like that, the very thing that had originally started Tycho down the path of astronomy in the first place. It turns out, though, that there are other ways to create ovals. One of the best understood, again, from the time of the Greeks, was a type of oval called an ellipse. Now, there are a couple of ways you can create an ellipse. One is to take a cone, set it on its base, and slice that cone so that the cut is not parallel to the base, but it also doesn't intersect the base. The edge of the slice will have an oval-like shape that's called an ellipse. It's from this description that we see an ellipse as one of what are called the four types of conic sections. The other three being a circle, which comes from slicing a cone parallel to its base, a parabola, which comes from slicing the cone perpendicular to its base, and something called a hyperbola. The other way of thinking of an ellipse is from a geometric definition. If a circle is the figure of all points in a plane equidistant from a single point, then an ellipse is all the points equidistant from two points in that plane. A good way to think of this is if you draw a circle, what you can do is tie a piece of string around a thumbtack on one end and then your pencil on the other. When the thumbtack is then stuck into a piece of paper, the figure that the string will allow your pencil to draw is a circle. Now let's say we redo that, but this time you tie the string so that one end is attached to one thumbtack while the other is attached to a second thumbtack. If you were then to place the pencil sort of inside the L made by pulling the string tight and draw the figure that the string now allows you to draw, the shape would be an ellipse. It turns out that the ellipse was between the off-center circle solution and the epicycle deferent solution that Kepler had been working with. He considered it once, but it hadn't worked out. But then he made the realization that if all the other planets were traveling in ellipses, the Sun would have to as well. Once he took this into account, things really started to fall into place. Another question, though, was how could he tell how fast a planet had to move each month in its orbit around the Sun, for example? To figure this out, he came up with an important insight. When looking at a planet's ellipse, he realized that the sun had to be at one of the points where you would have put a thumbtack if you were drawing that figure. In mathematics, these points actually have a name. We call them a focus. What Kepler saw was that if the sun was placed at the focus of each planet's ellipse, a relationship between the planet's distance to the sun and how fast it moved could be determined. The way this gets stated is that if you imagine a line connecting the sun to the planet that would then sort of sweep out a colored wedge over the period of a month, the area of that wedge would always be the same month after month after month. When the planet was closer to the sun, for example, a point we call perihelion, 
the planet would move faster, and so while the line would be shorter, the wedge would be wider. When the planet was far away, near the point we call aphelion, the line would be long, but the planet wouldn't move as fast, so the wedge would be tall and skinny. In both cases, the two wedges would have exactly the same area. This curta creates two what we call natural laws, or that's what they get called later. These sometimes get called Kepler's laws of planetary motion. The first law of planetary motion basically says a planet will travel around the sun in an ellipse with the sun at one focus. The second law of planetary motion, according to Kepler, is if you have an imaginary line connecting the planet to the sun, that line will sweep out equal areas and equal times. Once Kepler sorts out these two things, he's got most of the answer to the whole problem. Though the work was completed by 1606, there were a number of issues getting it published. However, finally, in 1610, Astronomia Nova, or New Astronomy, is made available to the astronomers and mathematicians of Europe, and it's a work of breathtaking scope. In this, Kepler takes his reader on a meticulous journey through his process of discovery in order to lead them to the same conclusions he has reached. His two laws of planetary motion allow him to predict the motions of the planets with a significantly greater accuracy than anything that had come before him. It's a truly remarkable triumph of combining observational data with mathematical modeling. Moreover, while Kepler does not abandon his desire to see his polyhedral model work, the new elliptical orbits are pretty much a death blow to the idea that all heavenly motions must be in circles. Additionally, Kepler also proposed a possible force that the Sun may create that propelled the planets. In 1600, William Gilbert, who had once been the physician of Queen Elizabeth I of England, published a book titled De Magnete, or Of Magnets, that established, among other things, that the Earth possessed a global magnetic field that was responsible for the movement and deflection of compass needles. Kepler suggested that if the Earth had such a field, it would be logical to assume that the Sun had one as well that could, possibly, push the planets around. Again, this turned out to be incorrect, but Kepler was again breaking new ground in thinking about the physical causes of planetary motion. Following this, Kepler continued to seek a harmonic relationship between the speeds of the planets and their orbits and their distances from the Sun. After 10 years of work, he arrived at his third or harmonic law of planetary motion that did just that. Now, during this decade, Kepler receives a copy of the work of an Italian natural philosopher whose use of a new tool, the telescope, has allowed him to spy a number of new phenomena in the heavens. We'll dig into this and other work by Galileo in a later episode. Nevertheless, the publication of this work set the European astronomical community on fire. For his part, Kepler was asked, in his role as imperial mathematician, to comment on Galileo's work which he did in about a 35-page publication. However, as Galileo would not communicate the details of his telescope design to his co colleague, the letter was only able to say that the telescope was a plausible instrument for making the type of observations that Galileo reported. This was rectified when Kepler published work on lenses based on optics that showed how a telescope worked and actually improved on Galileo's design. In between the publication of the two works, Kepler was able to get a hold of a telescope Galileo had sent to the Elector of Cologne, and with four friends, who all made independent observations, he was able to confirm Galileo's findings. Now this was also a time of continued unrest for Kepler, as issues related to the religious strife continued to impact his life, as did a number of personal tragedies. In order to avoid the evolving strife taking place in Prague, he moved to Linz in 1612. It was there that he would begin publishing a seven-volume epitome of Copernican astronomy between the years of about 1516 and 1521 that, much like Regiomonte's epitome of the Almagest had done, added enormously to the work of the older astronomer. 
in this case by recasting Copernicus's circular heliocentric model as an elliptical one. It was also during this time that he would publish his book, Harmony of the Worlds, in 1519 that contained his third law of planetary motion. Coinciding also with the work of the epitome, Kepler was forced to defend his mother from charges of witchcraft, an episode we'll explore in much greater detail in a supplemental episode. It was exhausting and difficult work, but his stature as imperial mathematician, a post he had kept even as Rudolf had lost the throne to his younger brother, had allowed him to spare his mother the fate that befell thousands of other women in Germany during this time. The Counter-Reformation caught up to him in Linz in 1622. He remained as best he could in the city, working to complete the planetary tables first Tycho and then he had promised Rudolf some 20 years earlier. These Rudolphin tables were to become the standard of astronomical calculation until the work of Isaac Newton and Edmund Halley. Finally, however, in 1626, things became too difficult in Linz, and Kepler fled once more, this time to the town of Ulm. It was there that he would finish the tables and begin the work of getting them printed, a time-consuming task given their complexity. As the work neared completion in 1529, he realized that he would be able to predict two events that had never before been observed, both of which were scheduled to take place in 1631. These were the transits of Mercury and Venus across the face of the Sun. With telescopic observation now becoming more commonplace, Kepler realized that the accuracy of his tables could be trusted when they said that on certain given dates, the two planets would cross the face of the Sun and thus could be observed. Unfortunately, Kepler wouldn't live to see whether his predictions came true. In 1630, he would travel first to Leipzig and then to Regensburg to take care of a variety of matters. On the leg to Regensburg, he came down with a fever that soon worsened. On November 15th, he took his last breath after confessing his faith and receiving last rites. His epitaph, carved on his gravestone, read, I measured the heavens, now the earth's shadows I measure. Sky bound my mind, earth bound my body rests. As we come to the end of this portion of our narrative, let me sketch out the journey forward. Next week, I want to say a few words about the story of Giordano Bruno and how it fits into the broader narrative of the evolving religious landscape of Europe, as that will have a good deal of impact on our story going forward. Following that, we will look at the scientific work of Galileo both in natural philosophy and in his use of the telescope. This will mark a bit of a natural breaking point where we can go back and do a series of biographical episodes on both Kepler and Galileo that will take a number of weeks. In the middle of all of that somewhere will fall our 100th episode. And as I've said, I'd like it to be a question and answer show. So please send me your inquiries either by posting them on our Facebook page, tweeting me, at Chad Davies is my handle there on Twitter, emailing me at cldavies at mac.com or by leaving a comment on our website, thescientificodyssey.typepad.com. Send me questions on anything. Seriously, ask me about my favorite sports team or what grad school was like or what kind of bicycle I ride or whatever. If you want, tell me about yourself in the, the message and something about the show you've particularly enjoyed. Let's work together to create something for our journey that everybody can enjoy. We've got about a month to go until this thing happens, so it'd be great if you could start getting the questions in. As always, thanks for listening, and until next time, full sails on your journey. <laughs>